Hello, I'm Rob Hirschfeld, your host of the weekly Distance DevOps Lunch and Learn. Uh, this week we have actually a really exciting set of sessions. Um, Federico Lucifredi gave us actually two sessions and I'm going to present it as two videos. So um, video one is about using Raspberry Pis and building a Raspberry Pi cluster. Um, so he'll show you how he's done that and what he put together for that. And then he has a whole separate topic, another 20 minutes, about uh, supercomputing and how you optimize distributed algorithms and how they work and, and all sorts of amazing stuff. I split it into two videos. Pick and choose which one you want. Uh, both were fantastic. So um, definitely check it out. If you know somebody who should be speaking, please contact me. Uh, we are always looking for speakers who want to talk and share some knowledge for 45 minutes on a Tuesday afternoon. Thanks. It's basically what, uh, what, uh, what about supercomputers and Pi? So it's mm -hmm. a little bit of introduction to fundamentals of supercomputing, like uh, the Flynn taxonomy, uh, which, is not, uh, which is not the Flynn from Tron. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, and um, and giving a few references to um, to students that basically may have not seen this before. Now, uh, in terms of enabling um, this kind of stack on the Pi's, it's pretty simple. You just install a whole bunch of binaries, um, at least on the master, to be able to compile the code. And then uh, you want to open MPI on uh, on the mm -hmm. secondary nodes so that um, so that you can drive. Um, you can drive the executables compiled with OpenMPI from node zero onto the secondaries. Now, um, um, MPI is, is uh, an insult to C syntax as far as I'm concerned. It's some of the ugliest code that I've ever seen. But once you get used to it, it kind of does make sense. Um, you make a function call and then after that, function call that code is running on every node in parallel. And then you make another function call and you're collecting, collecting the, the results. It's ugly um, pretty much in the same way some parts of C++ are ugly. So I guess we don't get to play. Um, but it works and it's pretty much um, uh, one of the standard ways to write parallel code. So here we're just going over how to do it and you compile an MPI executable this way, and then you you invoke it saying how many copies of, of it do you want to run. Now, when you say MPI exec and eight, you just say that you want eight of them, but the part that we do care about is MPI exec with capital H, where we're saying where do you want them to run. In this case, we're just going to pass the host name of each node of the cluster and we can pass that um, reasonably up to four times because the Raspberry Pi for um, CPUs have four uh, cores. So um, in the example here, the call prox code is being run, um, it looks like eight ways, right? It's same thing as this line here, but instead of running eight wherever, it's running eight on node two and node one, which are not, um, if we call this from node zero, they're completely idle. So we should be getting the full, um, the full power of the system. Uh, oh, cool. Now I can hear it. Nothing fan sounds like it's running. Let's see, is it? Yeah. So that code, um, the code is linked from the slide, but that code doesn't do anything except just launching the processes uh, on different um, on different threads, basically. Makes sense. It's a most uh, it's a hello world to multi-threaded MPI. In terms of references, there are there is basically this book uh, called Build Supercomputers with Raspberry Pi 3 uh, that came out a few years back. Um, a lot of the things that the book uh, goes into pretty much can be done straight of the box uh, today and they are uh, they are covered in this presentation. It was basically our cluster setup. But I like the way uh, the author, who is a scientist working for NASA, 
basically walks his students step by step so that they learn a little bit about computers and a little bit about clusters. And it's very, um, it handholds people quite a bit. So I think that there is um, a lesser likelihood that they're going to get lost because they get some, uh, some help along the way because it's, um, it's explained in different ways. Now, um, there is an out of order on the slide, I think. Maybe not. Um, so, um, one typical example is, um, yeah, there is an out of order in the slides. Mm. Well, we'll resolve that later, but, um, I see. Oh, maybe there was another slide here and this is just showing too much of the results. So an example here is running uh, this code MPI 08B, uh, which is a simple code that calculates pi uh, numerically. And it's just approximating an integral and uh, doing work um, to, uh, to approximate the area under the curve to, um, to calculate that integral. And, um, depending on how many slices do you have, you figure out you have different levels of precision in the resulting number. We're literally throwing CPU at the problem, which is why we're making these uh, Blade Runner jokes about cycles will, will be lost, but that's fine. Um, we have the CPUs so we can use them, right? It's just, it's not very efficient in the sense that we're going from 10,000 calculations for 10 digits to 300,000 calculations for 13 digits. So um, obviously it's very brute force-ish, but, um, but it's fine. And that's what supercomputers are about. Uh, here is some example in terms of the timing uh, of getting to 12 digit precision. The more, um, the more threads we throw in, the faster we are, but it's far from linear. We're going from um, 20 seconds with four threads to 15 seconds with twice the resources we're saving 25% of the cost of the time. So obviously there is a cost to parallelism and um, part of it is parallelism itself and part of it is network overhead of course. So if we actually ran the comparison um, of running a parallel code with four nodes oh, on the local node so no network communication versus splitting it. The second example between uh, one node and another node, um, we, uh, we're looking at 6.5% difference just there, just because of the network communication uh, overhead. And it's, wow. it's kind of cool how you can show it in this particular case. Um, I guess the, the Raspberry Pi itself is fast enough and their network is bound to, to be uh, it's one gigabit, so it's it's what it is. Um, that that you can actually surface that uh, that overhead very practically in in the examples during the talk. Uh, the rest, and this is actually another point that's interesting about the Pi Four. It's that the Pi Four is actual uh, gigabit networking, not USB fake gigabit networking like the Pi Three. So the Three. The networking on the four is significantly better. It's not just the CPU, but the CPU still way, way, way outstrips the, the network. And the gains on CPU in four are more than the gains on network in four. So the, the imbalance is, is even greater in four than it was in three, uh, which is why I, I was able to see this example first when I, this distinction between PC and running all on the same host versus splitting on two hosts. Um, I noticed that very obviously on the four because of of the strength of the CPU on the four. And here is going back to the three, you can see um, um, the comparison between the two and um, um, and we're calculating the speed up ratio to show uh, what speed up is. Uh, so we had the original time and what we achieved with eight threads and, uh, and, um, and we're doing this both on the four and on the three. And the, um, 
the speed up is actually better on the three uh, because the individual CPUs of the four are so much stronger to begin with that they, they've already eaten into the problem significantly and they, they don't gain as much. And I guess the, the part that uh, I was mentioning before and that was causing the out of sequencing is that this is the slide that shows how uh, we were calculating pi on the MPI 08 code. It's basically um, calculating the integral under that, that curve and it's mm. numerically slicing the integral in however many pieces to get, um, to get uh, the number. And um, then we just discuss how to, um, how to calculate the speed up numbers. I think that what is interesting here is the, the non-linearity. So um, um, the first observation is that if only 5% of the code is non-parallelizable, then um, we, can, we have a, a bottleneck where we can say that uh, the best we can do is achieve a 20x speed up. Now, um, these heuristics where speed up is the ratio of the old and the new, and you make some assumptions that uh, are not necessarily realistic, are, are a cool way to just do back of the napkin analysis of how fast will I be able to run this code when I throw everything in the kitchen sink at it. If it needs to be two times faster, four times faster, there's a good chance you can find a way. If it needs to be 10 times faster or 20 times faster, that's the time when people start raising eyebrows because yes, you can throw a CUDA at the problem and you can, you can even write code uh, to run this in hardware in an FPGA if you are the military. There are all sorts of optimizations that you can do, but there are core limitations that come from the fact that not all code can be parallelized. And just by looking at what the non-parallelizable part is, you can make some assumptions as to what the maximum speed up is. Uh, in this example, if 95% of the code can be parallelized, you can calculate the fraction and you can see that 20x speed up is realistically the limit to what you're going to be accomplishing. Now this is, uh, this is uh, further baked into Amdahl's law and um, the assumptions that I was talking about are essentially that the amount of work is constant. So what we're saying that there is a limit to speed up only holds if you're not using the fact that you have more CPU resources to do more work. So yes, if you're doing the same work and you're spreading it across multiple CPUs, then you have the limit to the speed up and you can bound the problem that way. Um, also, you have to somewhat ignore the network effects. Um, but that, that the limitation can be overcome in the sense that you have more CPU, you can also do more work. You can look at more data. And so you can still get the benefit. And I think that there is a variation of this called Gustafsson's law that tries to express that. Um, you can look at a bigger data set if you have more CPU and still exceed the benefit that you uh, expected from the speed up. But um, here is the example of, the, of um, if only half of your code can be accelerated, you re realistically will not get uh, more than, um, um, than a 2x speed up according to Indal's law. If you look at the benefit that you're getting in this particular co case of the, of the code, um, uh, I'm sorry, in, in general, not in particular, in the general case of a 50% code, um, you can see that around 12 cores, you have reached 1.84 X speed up, you pretty much maxed out um, how far you can go. So you can size the number of cores that it makes sense to spend on the problem by looking at uh, where the where Aimdahl's law says that you have basically reached the limit of, of diminishing returns. Now this is with 50% serial code. If only 5% serial code, so what I was discussing before, 95% of the code can be parallelized, then uh, for reference, the 50% line is down there. Um, we can go way uh, farther in terms of how many CPUs we can use. And, uh, and the asymptote here is 20. 
we can go to 20x speed up once once the bottleneck is down to five percent right that makes sense interesting yeah that's a, it's remarkably uh how different the uh, curve becomes it's interesting shape, I, uh, as back of the napkin tools to be able to estimate how much you will be able to accelerate most And then the, the last thing that, um, that I'll show is this, uh, which is um, basically um, we can run Monte Carlo simulations on the cluster very nicely. And uh, Monte Carlo is a numerical approach to calculate, um, to resolving problems. And um, uh, basically it's a cool way to use random numbers. In the case of solving pi with Monte Carlo, you can think of it as having a dartboard and saying that you're throwing darts at the board and you're counting the number of darts that hit the board versus the number of darts that are outside of the board. And by the ratio of those two, you approximate pi. And if your board is actually made of Raspberry Pis, <laughs> because when you, map your, when you map your square onto the Pis using MPI, that's what you're doing. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's a nice way to think about it. So there, there is a little bit of, uh, of tweaking the math in the sense that obviously you can only hit a square of a certain size outside of the board and so on. But if you take the ideal setup of the problem, which is that you have a square of size one, one by one, and you are taking the circle, uh, the circle sector um, in that area, um, you have to uh, do a little bit of adjustment. I think that you have to multiply by four to get the correct ratio, but the, the principle holds and just by the ratio of hits inside versus outside, assuming that you have a, a uniform probability distribution for your randomness, you'll be able to calculate pi. And uh, the code actually is um, quite straightforward. Uh, you just have a little bit of setup. Um, you initialize the, um, the random number generator and then um, this is literally all that you're doing. You're just taking random numbers and counting. The only part that is um, uh, interesting here in terms of Raspberry Pi specifically is that Raspberry Pi, the Pi Foundation decided that um, uh, they would keep the user land to 32 bits. And when you're playing with supercomputers, that's not so cool. Um, when these, um, um, when these um, uh, Monte Carlo methods for pi were uh, coded, actually, no, this was not coded for pi. This was coded by uh, Oak Ridge, the national laboratory. But uh, when I first ran them on the pi three, um, we didn't have the kind of CPU power where these things would run into really huge numbers. So it was fine. 32-bit data types were fine. Uh, we're not going to get more than 4 billion hits into the board. No problem. And so having uh, doubles that were uh, sized to 32 bits was one thing. And then having integers uh, sized to 4 billion was also OK. Now with the Raspberry Pi 4, you're getting more CPU. And then we have a cluster. You're getting more numbers. In fact, across this three node cluster, I get more than, than 4 billion counts uh, just in a few seconds of the, of the algorithm uh, because it's so perfectly parallelizable. Monte Carlo methods are neat because they have no critical section. So you, they can be parallelized indefinitely. And so you run into the problem that the user land of, of the Pi is 32 bits. And you have to rewrite all your code saying long double or stuff like that. That makes it quite ugly and actually quite unnecessary. You should just be running the 64-bit user line. So in a future version of the talk, I think I'll, I'll either use uh, Ubuntu, 20, Ubuntu Server 2004, which now is being built for the, for the Pi, uh, and it is 64 bits natively, or I'll use Armbian. Um, uh, also in 64 bits native and move away from uh, Raspbian, uh, which is the base of the Pico cluster images because it's just getting in the way. Uh, the data types are not making use of the fact that we have a 64 bit CPU and it, it kind of complicates the presentation needlessly. With the Pi 3 cluster, it's entirely fine. 
no problem. We can do it everything in 32 bits. But in with the Pi 4 cluster, um, we we need the 64 bit data types. Yeah. And then uh, next thing that I want to do, which I haven't developed yet, is that I want to have a um, a finite element example. Uh, this is usually another approach that uh, that mathematical problems are broken across um, supercomputing nodes, where um, you run individual parts of the problem and then you define how uh, how they relate to each other. Typical example of finite elements is that you calculate the temperature of a, a piece of material, metal, let's say, at different parts of it, and then you have rules on how heat conducts across these different elements and and you have the um, the reconciliation between the codes basically is uh, the routine that distributes the heat across the object these are usually the most complicated parallel codes you can write but they are also the most useful um, when um, when I used to teach I actually wrote um, a gravity model that was built using um, using a finite element to distribute a gravity simulation of, um, of the gravity of a um, satellite of uh, Jupiter Europa, so that, um, uh, well, this is a very long story, but generally speaking, when you calculate gravity, you make the assumption that the mass is all concentrated in one point. When the masses are too close, that assumption goes out the window and you can't just do Newton's math, you have to do um, you have to account for tides and uh, interesting heating phenomena happen uh, happen on Europa because of the closeness between Europa and Jupiter and because of the passage of the nearby other large satellites so these tides cause heating phenomena which then melt the water in this uh, in this little world you can't simulate this just by using Newton uh, on the body as an object as a whole object, you have to go and basically fracture the object in many, many, many little parts and then calculate uh, Newton's gravity between the individual parts as if they were independent bodies to account for the fact that the mass is a point assumption has been removed. So that is an interesting parallelization problem, uh, but it's not one that fits in one slide. So I don't know that I will use that in my finite element example. And I know that the heat problem doesn't fit in one slide either. So I'm trying to find a finite element problem that's easy to explain. <laughs> and that, uh, that basically will be the last thing in the talk. Uh, that's going to be an interesting challenge. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, clapping. I, I, we get the virtual <laughs> clapping too. That was great. Oh my God. I love learning all this stuff. All right, Frederica, I appreciate the, uh, wow. I This was like two talks, because you got the all the RPI buildup stuff and then a whole bunch of parallel <laughs> Thanks, computer Bob. stuff, which is really cool. So uh, two for one, I actually might might uh, consider breaking it and letting, letting running it as two different posts so that uh, people can jump into the middle if they want to just learn the <laughs> supercomputing stuff. Yeah, uh, one thing that I would ask as a question is if, um, if uh, operations wise, um, is there any um, anything else that we should be adding here besides, uh, as far as I can see, we have everything between the, um, mm. the little cluster management setup, user access, network access, time setup, so. shared folder, and, um, and uh, then the output with the, with the LEDs. But if there are any other operational ideas in terms of things that are convenient running a cluster. And um, you're, you're building, you're building cards for each Pi, right? So you're, you're installing an SD card already and then you're running roughly yeah. off the SD card. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then you're relying on the Wi-Fi for each one to provide access for the, for the Wi-Fi. So um, yeah, each one of them has Wi-Fi access to, to the local network, just so that they can reach the internet, basically. Okay. What, um, what we what we did with the Edge Lab is mm -hmm. we did something similar, except only uh, the 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 Pi Zero, the the gateway that's running Rebar, um, has Wi-Fi. So we count on the Wi-Fi as the internet access point, and then all of the machines will use that as a gateway. Um, 
because we really don't run that much to the, the internet. And then um, mm. some of the things we then cache on the, the edge node, on the, the Pi right. node. And so um, it keeps you from having to, since we have rebar available as a, as a server, we then, then you can just say, oh yeah, I'm gonna store that and then save it for all the other machines. Um, and that, that, was, that meant that all of the machines didn't have to touch um, touch, get on the Wi-Fi, which can be trickier. But for us, the other thing that we did with that was it meant that we can recycle all of the other machines in the cluster super fast. So like you're, we're constantly um, just bringing in, taking the, the worker nodes in and out without having to reset, a, a, actually without having to reset an SD card because we're pixie booting, um, but also without having to reset up the Wi-Fi and, and all the mess with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. So that's, and it's not hard. I mean, it's, it's actually really easy to do a, a, a gateway on the, on the first node and then um, channel through. And right. The, then the uh, network configuration is completely static every time. The gateway is, uh, is pretty easy to do. Um, I, I did think of that. I didn't, uh, I didn't do it in the end because I didn't want to uh, teach people how to set up a cache, but, um, but um, it would make sense. Like you said, it, it would accelerate things because then you would have all the packages cached on the first node and, and you could build new nodes really, really fast. In this case, I guess we, we took the, the lazy way out, which is because all the nodes have their own ether, they have their own internet connection, they can, uh, they can steal bandwidth from the local network. <laughs> Um, oh, that's true. But um, but yeah, it's it's not the cleanest design there. I agree. That was our our, our thought was that we effectively simulated the fire firewalling effect. Um, although right. I, I I bypassed that and just attached directly to the endpoint. But it it looks it like our goal with Edge Lab was to not do a supercomputer, but to do an edge site. And in an edge site, you're going to be you know local network plus a gateway rather than every everybody connected. So that's All right. what I'm trying to simulate. That's cool. That's really neat. Thank you. All right. Uh, I, I'm excited, but I'm a little bit over time. So <laughs> let us wrap it up. And then uh, next week, we're going to talk about attending virtual conferences. And then Sherry's going to talk about uh, Agile and DevOps, which I think is going to be super cool. All right, everybody. I'll talk to you next week. Thanks. Well, thank you.